Good morning. Uh, today is March 15, 2022. It is 8.30 a.m. Uh, state local government committee will come to order. Uh, for the record, we do have a quorum. Uh, if everyone could please stand uh, for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, this morning we have two bills on the agenda. Uh, the first bill is Senate File 3414, authored by Senator Dreheim. Uh, before we get to this bill, I would like to announce that since this bill has been uh, vetted in another committee, and we have uh, another bill on the agenda today, we will be limiting testimony uh, to one to two minutes for each testifier. Uh, the deadline for the public testimony was 2 p.m. yesterday. Uh, also, there's a written uh, testimony in your folders that did not make the deadline, so that will be out so everybody has that uh, there. Uh, this bill will be sent to general orders, and I would like to take a vote today on it by 9.45 uh, so we can finish up with the other bill. So uh, we have testifiers, uh, but before we do that, Senator Dreheim, uh, to your bill. Thank you, Chair and, and members, and good morning to everybody. Um, real simple, uh, this prohibits local government from enacting rent control policies on private residential properties. This bill is retroactive to November 1st, 2021, which would have the uh, effects of nullifying the votes in St. Paul and Minneapolis to admit. Can't hear you. Could nobody hear you? No, no one hears right. you. There we go. Oh. He is muted, thank you. Oh, you were muted the whole time? I'm sorry. Uh, Senator Dre, I'm going to start over again so everybody out that's uh, uh, on remote because we have quite a few today. If you could sure. uh, pre please restart. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so real simple, Senate File 3414 members uh, prohibits the local government from enacting rent control policies on private residential properties. This bill is retroactive to November 1st of 2021, which would have the effect of nullifying the votes in St. Paul and Minneapolis to enact or pursue rent control. And with that, I know we're short of time. Uh, I, I would really like to go to testifiers and then we can come back to the, to the bill. Uh, we did have one question um, from Senator Newman right before the hearing started. If we could, do you wanna address that now? Senator Newman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and maybe Senate Council could help lines uh, 1.18, 1.19 uh, is uh, they, they are citing a statute. Could you uh, could you explain what that what that means? I, I just don't know what it is. Sir, Mr. Chair, members. So, Mr. Chairman, uh, it, de it deals with the tax code, not with uh, the uh, the prohibition of the rent control. Correct. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, with that, we will proceed to testifiers. Uh, we have a few in person, and we have some remote. So, we're going to start uh, with the people in person. Uh, Mr. Paul Egger, please come to the testifier stand, state your name, who you're with, and proceed with your testimony. Uh, Mr. Chairman good, and members, good morning. My name is Paul Egger. I'm Senior Vice President of Governmental Affairs for the Minnesota Realtors Association. We're a statewide business trade association with around 21,000 members uh, from the real estate industry statewide. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify today in support of Senator Dreheim's Senate File 3414. Uh, I know you have a lot of testifiers, so I'll be brief. Um, rent control is not the answer to our housing challenges. We need more housing and more types of housing to meet demand, not policies like rent control that adversely affect property owners and reduce the quality and quantity of housing both new, both now and in the future. Rent control policies create disincentives to invest in the construction of new rental properties, 
rehabilitate existing properties, and convert buildings from non-residential to residential use. Those are all activities that would either increase our supply of housing or improve the quality of existing housing. Last session, this committee passed under Drayheim Senate File 912 to repeal the exception allowing local governments to control rents if approved by voters. Unfortunately, Senate File 912 was not enacted last session, and in November, both St. Paul and Minneapolis passed ballot measures on rent control. Over the past couple of months, there have been numerous reports by the media, along with testimony in the Housing Finance and Policy Committee over the course of two hearings of property owners, developers, and lenders responding rationally to the passage of those ballot questions by either raising rents, pausing projects, or looking outside of St. Paul and Minneapolis. Rent control is counterproductive to addressing our housing supply and affordability challenges. Instead, the focus should be on how to create the conditions that will result in more housing of all types to better meet consumer demand and achieve a market that is better balanced between landlords and tenants and buyers and sellers. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, Mr. Egger. Uh, next Thank on you. our testifier list, we have Cecil Smith. You could come to the testifier stand, please. Uh, good morning, uh, Chair Zinsky and uh, members of the committee. My name is Cecil Smith. I am the CEO and president of the Minnesota Multi-Housing Association with over 1,800 members representing 300,000 units of uh, rental housing in the state of Minnesota. Uh, thank you for your consideration of this uh, bill today. With only one city adopting a rent control ordinance by initiative and referendum, we can already see the chaos that it's created. Advocates for the rent control policy chose to create the most restrictive rent control policy in the United States, and it has been disastrous for our housing market. This policy has taken Minnesota off the national map for housing investment. This lack of investment when the population of St. Paul is growing faster than new housing availability is problematic and will worsen the housing crisis in our state. Policymakers should see what is happening in St. Paul and recognize that this is not a constructive way to alleviate our housing crisis. Stopping or pausing uh, on over 3,100 units of housing development in St. Paul is detrimental to the entire state. While the le legislature has made serious investments in affordable housing, those investments are small compared to the investments made by the private market. Minnesota should be looking for opportunities to increase investment in housing here. It is bad public policy to drive that investment to other states. It's important to realize that a rent control policy can be implemented in com communities around Minnesota with a relatively low threshold. For the city of Rochester, a city of over 120,000 people, a ballot initiative to put this to the voters can be made with just 3,100 signatures. In Bloomington, a city of over 89,000 people, a ballot initiative can be made with just 1,600 signatures. And it isn't just large cities. Small cities like Red Wing could see a ballot initiative pushed in their community with less than 550 signatures. I hope the legislature will support this proposal to reverse the bad policy decisions of our past and look to housing solutions that invest in Minnesota's most needy and build more housing for Minnesota's workforce. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Ann Schulman. Schulman, I'm sorry if I mis misspoke that. You did uh, great. Thank you. If you could um, uh, state name your is name, Anne. who you represent, and then proceed with your testimony. Um, I'm a renter in St. Paul. and um, you state I'm your a, name, please, for the record? Anne Schulman. Thank you. Um, a St. Paul renter. I'm a 61-year-old frontline health care worker on a fixed income and Minnesota care. I pay for rent out of alimony that I no longer receive. I could not afford an apartment of my own at my current salary and use retirement funds. For the past nine years, I've worked for Our Lady of Peace Community Hospice, currently as a contract employee doing Healing Touch, which is better for my back. My yearly salary increase is zero. In January of this year, the rent for the apartment that I'd moved into the previous year increased $100, which is close to 9%. Stability that I had regarding shelter and finances felt yanked away. One reason I was told for this steep rent hike was that they wanted to bring the apartment up to market value to meet this 3% cap. What did they mean by market value? Before I moved into this apartment, 
It sat vacant for at least five months. My current unit is a small two-bedroom apartment for $13.50 with few amenities. Two other units similar to mine remained vacant that whole year. Their list price dropped to $12.95. When my lease was about up, I requested my rent be lowered to match market value. Instead, I got a $100 increase. It's predatory practice, and predatory practice is common. The only way to stop such practices in the future is this 3% cap. I live on Marshall Avenue between Creton and Cleveland, and within these two blocks, there are currently four apartment complexes going up. It is clear that development will continue in St. Paul and that landlords are crying wolf trying to derail this important ordinance. In addition, housing inequities have excessively fallen on BIPOC households. Please this finish your testimony. Two minutes. Please what? finish up your testimony. Yeah. two minutes. This 3% cap will help address inequities and create stability. I encourage the Senate to move away from injurious action that might repeal this rent stabilization ordinance. Give this ordinance support and time. Step back from the brink and let the voters have a voice. We already voted. Thank you. Next, uh, uh, B. You. Ro Ros Rosas. Please state your name, who you're with, and proceed with your testimony. <laughs> Awesome. Hi, everyone. My name is B. Rosas. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Um, like I said, my name is B. Rosas. I use they and them pronouns, and I am a member of the Keep St. Paul Home Campaign and uh, Housing Equity Now St. Paul Coalition. Um, over the last year and a half, a lot of St. Paul residents and I spent a large chunk of our time uh, in the heat wave, in below zero weather, talking to over 30,000 people, um, letting them know about what was going on this next November and letting them know that this policy was on the ballot. Um, so when we spoke to these people, they spoke back and they said that they wanted rent stabilization to pass in St. Paul. Um, this number, of course, was very high. It was over 30,000 people that voted in this last election. That is no mistake. That was not a coincidence and that was not an accident. It was hard work in organizing that got us those numbers. And what we saw in St. Paul was an act of solidarity. Uh, people from wide ranges of job titles, races, cultures came together to address the housing inequities that we see in Minnesota and that we will continue to see if this bill passes. We cannot spread the message that community building is the problem, not when over 30,000 St. Paul residents voted this last November. Taking the way the right to organize your community is not only irresponsible, but it goes, it goes against democracy. Residents of St. Paul are relying on these votes and are relying on these election results to not get them displaced and to stabilize the rent. Local initiatives here are not the problem. No, local initiatives are the solution to generations of displacement, harms, inequalities that still exist in this state. This bill does not tackle any of that. We need to honor the voices of the people that spoke, that got brave enough to speak, and that are st still not brought to this table. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our next testifier is Tram Huang. Again, could you please state your name for the record, uh, who you're with, and proceed with your testimony. Yes, good morning. My name is Tram Huang. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Um, I am a homeowner in Minneapolis and the Director of Policy and Research at the Housing Justice Center, which is a housing policy advocacy organization and legal nonprofit. Um, our organization has won over 50 organizations across faith, labor groups, social service providers, community developers, and neighborhood organizations who work to engage tens of thousands of voters in Minneapolis with the Home to Stay Coalition and voters in St. Paul with the Housing Equity Now St. Paul Coalition. We are opposed to Senate File 3414 because conversations about how cities can address our housing crisis should happen in the communities in which people are experiencing housing instability with the people who see its impacts and have a deep understanding of what their neighbors need. Um, we must not take away the ability of cities to be responsive to the needs of residents, and the state must allow for localities to act as their electorate choose. Many real estate industry reps are telling doomsday stories of disinvestment and the end of all supply. But we know better. Real estate is complex, and from changes in zoning to interest rates, we know there are dozens of factors that influence investor decision making. Moreover, it is the industry's job to adapt to market conditions, not to threaten cities with disinvestment in order to pressure elected officials into going against the will of the voters. There are much larger forces at play, 
a labor shortage, rising interest rates, a supply chain crisis, and global economic shifts, we would be naive and gullible to think that of all the things happening in our country and world, a city ordinance, especially one that is in place in over 180 cities across the country, is to blame for shifting markets. Our housing crisis is the result of many issues and there's no silver bullet to solving it. Now is the time where we need as many tools as possible. Taking one away is not only harmful to our democracy, but also hurts our ability to ensure that every Minnesotan is housed. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just for the record, so uh, testifiers in person, we've done two minutes, uh, but we have a, a large number of online. Uh, so we're going to do a minute and a half for the online testifiers just to make sure uh, we get everybody in and can have a debate on the bill. Uh, so the next one on the testifier via Zoom, I have a Mr. Da Dana Kennedy. Uh, so if you could uh, turn on your mic and proceed with your testimony after you state your name for the record. Hi, I'm Dana Kennedy and I live in St. Paul. I was born into an upper middle class family, but alcoholism killed my father in his 30s. My mother had to sell everything and moved all five of us into a two bedroom apartment. We lived on the floor on mattresses with cockroaches and weevils. We had terrible landlords and sometimes had to move twice in a year. I don't want any child to go through the crazy instability that moving so many times created in my childhood. So I worked hard to pass rent stabilization in St. Paul. I'm insulted when I hear voters didn't understand what they were voting for. Voters heard both sides. In fact, many of the testifiers who support preemption had $4 million to persuade voters to vote no, yet they lost. Everyone's vote should count. The thought of a powerful few canceling tens of thousands of verified votes is bone chilling. Please don't pass this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, Teresa Delata. Yes, I'm Teresa Delata. I'm a leader with Home to Stay Minneapolis. And I've been a resident of Minneapolis for almost 20 years on and off. The off times have been when I was homeless. Since August of 2015, I have lived in the same one bedroom apartment where I now pay over 70% of my income towards my rent. I'm permanently disabled and only able to work part time. This past summer, I talked with others in the community. A lot of them are also worried about their rent jump, jumping too high or they will be forced out of their place of, that they call home. The citizens of Minneapolis voted in November to enable us to create a rent stabilization policy. This was the will of the majority of voters. I need to have my vote matter too. Not now, and now this bill is trying to take away my vote today, away, take away the vote of a disabled person. I ask you to all vote no against and against Senate file 3414. But our votes and the will of the residents be honored. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Delata. Uh, next, Mr. Youssef. Yes, hello. How's everybody doing? Um, I'm, I am I'm Mr. Abdelil uh, Youssef. Um, I am a teacher with uh, in uh, Minneapolis. Um, and I've been a teacher for over 10 years, uh, active teaching license. Um, and um, uh, I believe that I believe that uh, no matter um, what your, um, uh, your 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 zip code or your race or your ethnicity or the background that you're from or uh, your income, uh, we all need rent stabilization for for our communities, uh, especially especially since um, uh, we all voted on it and um, the vote was it was to be passed. And so, by directly uh, by directly trying to undo the vote, it is uh, it is in a way trying to uh, take away the voices of so many people who voiced their vote for it. It is uh, is undemocratic. Uh, it is um, it is a front to uh, the process of voting itself, uh, which, uh, after all, that's how all of the senators and the governors here got their positions to begin with, by people voting. So. By undoing this, I believe that it will be very detrimental to the most uh, to, to to democracy itself and also to 
everyone who is uh, in desperate need of it. As you know, every summer uh, in Minneapolis, there is homeless encampments, uh, and those homeless encampments are a result of uh, gentrification because of uh, landlords putting uh, profit over people and raising the rents just so they can make a little bit more money. And by providing rent stabilization, please finish up your testimony. Uh, we are voting for that to end, and we're voting for stabilization for our, our kids, our communities, our families, and everyone. So uh, I believe the needs of many outweigh the needs of a few, and the few are the landlords who put profit over people, and the needs of many are the citizens of Minnesota who have spoken and voiced their vote. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Yusuf. Uh, next, uh, yes. Ms. Cynthia Brown. Ms. Brown, are you online? Yes, yes, I am. Okay, go um, ahead, uh, state your name and proceed. My name is Cynthia Brown, and I am a resident of North Minneapolis and a leader with BBCC. This is my renting experience and how I struggled to uh, pay the high cost of renting in the past. Due to the extremely high cost of renting, starting with losing money from many bogus costs of application fees for subpar housing, ranging from $25 to $75 per adult, just to have my application denied and no refund for the application fee. The current expectations of the housing market is requiring an initial payment of three times the rent which breaks down to the first month's rent, the last month's rent, and a damaged deposit. When my husband passed away, I was devastated. I didn't even have a chance to grieve the loss of my husband. Our landlord, who was totally rude and disrespectful to me, kicked me out of the apartment. I was renting. I was struggling to maintain paying the high rent to no avail. I became homeless for two and a half years and I felt powerless and hopeless hopelessness. I had no one to that no one I could turn to and at the time. Two minutes please uh, finish up with your testimony ma'am. Okay well what I wanted to say that uh, as a woman who understands I am um, vo I, I, my, my voice needs to be heard and my vote needs to count. So I am uh, hoping that you vote against this uh, FS 3414. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Uh, next, uh, Mr. Keisha, or, uh, Keisha Steele. Hi, my name is Keisha Steele. I am a core leader with BBC. I'm also a former renter um, from St. Paul, now in North Minneapolis. I went from paying $925 in Minneapolis in St. Paul, coming to Minneapolis paying $1275 plus heat and gas. I'm just here as a single mother trying to figure out what we can do about um, getting rent stabilization. It's hard out here for a single parents. It's hard out here for a single person even to get where they need to be. Um, as, Explaining my process in democracy, I've been here, and I just want to create a change and enforce a change. How can legislators give us something and then take it away? We need this change in Minneapolis. We need this change to continue in St. Paul. We want stable housing for our families. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Steele. Uh, next, Robin Wansley Worlaba. If I mispronounce that, I apologize, but if you could please uh, state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you so much. I am Council Member Robin Wansley, and I get to represent Ward 2 on the Minneapolis City Council. Um, I'm here to speak against Bill SF 3414. Um, I cannot speak for many of you, but I ran for public office because I grew tired of watching our multiracial democracy be attacked and eroded every single day. And we've seen these attacks come in a variety of forms, but it also looks like the legislation we're discussing today. Um, on November 2nd, 2021, thousands of residents in St. Paul and in Minneapolis overwhelmingly voted in favor of rent stabilization. Uh, many of these residents voted because they know that our respective cities' housing stock is becoming increasingly cost burdened as a result of our profit-driven housing market. 
These residents voted not only because they want to set a new standard of housing equity, but they also want local leaders like you and myself to enact measures like rent stabilization to accomplish this. Um, Twin Cities voters spoke very clearly then on November 2nd. They support rent stabilization and they want their elected leaders to en enact these measures. Um, what the voters did not ask for is for elected leaders like yourselves to preempt it, nor did they ask for you to undermine their vote. With that said, please do not move forward with this anti-democratic legislation if we're all truly committed to building and strengthening our multiracial democracy. Thank you all. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, Kim Hawa Jung. If I've mispronounced that, I apologize again. Uh, if you could please state your name and proceed with your testimony. Yeah, thank you so much. Yep, it's, uh, my name's Hwa Jung Kim. Uh, she, her, I live in the north end of St. Paul. I'm the executive director at Minnesota Voice. We fight to expand voter access and protect voter rights through grassroots organizing. Minnesota Voice supported the Keep St. Paul Home campaign and I personally supported the campaign. I'm opposed to Senate File 3414. This bill strips voters of their rights. 60,000 voters in St. Paul engaged with the issue of rent stabilization, which is more than any single mayoral candidate and more than any total mayoral election result in the last 30 years. I'm a former planning commissioner who served on the zoning committee. I'm a former legislative aide to the city council president, and I've worked on many different types of development projects in our city. Before my time in city hall, I worked at Twin Cities Habitat for Humanity. And over my five plus years working in affordable housing, the single greatest factor for the hundreds of families I worked with that limited their ability to have safe, secure, decent housing was rising costs of rent. But we know that is not true for the housing market. There are so many factors, not just rent amounts, that influence investors and the development of housing. Even I, despite my direct experience with affordable housing and having worked in City Hall, would never believe that of all the things influencing the state's housing landscape, a city ordinance is to blame. Rent stabilization has been passed in 180 other cities and has been a tool for over 100 years to help alleviate the rising cost of shelter in times of economic crisis. You are limiting municipalities' ability to, the to its residents' needs. Please vote against Senate File 3414. It is a threat to our democracy and is a short-sighted solution to our housing crisis. Thank you. Uh, if you could mute your mic, if you're not speaking, we have some interruption there. Uh, next on the list, we have uh, Tahiti Robinson. If you could please state your name and proceed with your testimony. Whoops, you're muted, ma'am. You're muted. Oh, hello, can you hear me now? Now we can, go ahead. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Tahiti Robinson. And I'm addressing you today as a resident and a BBC leader concerning Bill SF3414. I'm here because of the struggle that my son has had finding an affordable place to rent. I'm able to enjoy a fixed rental space that I would like everyone to enjoy, but more realistically, to enjoy stable rent. I was feeling optimistic when I saw that my vote to change my city charter to allow rent stabilization was successful. But now I am very concerned that my vote will be nullified. This bill is moving in the wrong direction for a lot of disenfranchised people it will send a very strong message to the concentrated of people of color that live in the metro area. I not only remember, but I enjoy the Voting Rights Act of 1955, which banned literacy tests and other methods used to disenfranchise black voters. This bill, feels like it's designated to discourage voters in the metro area. Bill. Bill 37341 tells me that my constitutional right from the 15th Amendment since 1870 really doesn't matter. Thank you for your time. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, next, Harvey Mitchell Bryant, if you could uh, please state your name and proceed with your testimony. 
Hi, I'm Jarve Mitchell Bryant. I'm Jarve Mitchell Bryant. Um, I am a BBC leader. Um, I just feel like the F, this FS thirty four one four would be would be um, man. Give me one second. I had everything written. Sorry. Oh my goodness. So basically, what I basically I feel like. This law shouldn't be passed. I mean, it's like ripping the band-aids off people. You know, I've I've been a young black man in the community trying to find affordable housing rent, rent, and it's like if it's if we have this law passed, it's not gonna be able. I mean, it's not gonna be able to help people be more into the community that's trying to do something better with their lives. And for people that's just like me trying to get here. And just trying to live a successful life and have fun and enjoy some of the things that even the people like you that's sitting on the bench enjoy. You know, it's like give give our city a chance. We're still we're still rebuilding and still getting back to where we're trying to be at. So that's all I have to say. Thank you, Mr. Bryant. Uh, next, Wintana Malikan. Again, I apologize if I missed uh, quoted that name, but please state your name and proceed with your testimony. Yeah. Hi, y'all. My name is Wintana Melikin. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. Uh, I moved to the United States when I was three. I've been a St. Paul resident ever since then. Uh, when I moved to the States, there were some affordable housing programs that pretty much caused a massive shift in my life. I went from being a kid born in a civil war to a person who had a safe place to stay. Programs like that no longer exist. Um, but programs are like, uh, like that are what um, got me out of poverty. They're what got my family and my three siblings out of poverty. Um, I had that opportunity to go on and work for an amazing organization and start amazing businesses to having siblings who currently work for our state government. And that was all through programs that formerly existed, programs that are no longer funded and supplied. I joined a coalition to uh, provide rent stabilization. That coalition was supported by a majority, a majority of voters in St. Paul. That was one. It was designed, the policy was designed by the people who are most impacted by it. And now what I'm seeing is that folks in state government that don't live in this community are interfering in local politics. And what I assumed is that this policy wouldn't actually be coming from a set of folks that are continuously talking about government overreach. And I'm just confused as to why people are stepping in to dismantle the request of an individual community. We work together to pass this policy, and I'm just confused why there are a set of folks not from here working to dismantle it. And so I encourage everyone, regardless of party, regardless of belief or position on this policy, to not dismantle our voting rights, to not interfere in our local politics, and to continue to let the actual residents of St. Paul and whatever city decides to do this in whatever way they want to govern themselves as they have the right to. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, next, uh, Rara Navarro, uh, please. Uh, State your name and proceed with your testimony. Hello, thank you. My name is Rara Navarro. I work for Wesco, uh, pronouns her, she, and I am opposed to Senate file 3414. I am a St. Paul renter and I live on the west side, that is District 3 or 2. I grew up in St. Paul. My family has faced displacement multiple times due to rent hikes. I believe in the power of voting, whether yes or no. In November of 2021, over 30,000 residents voted yes for the rent stabilization in the city of St. Paul. Every single pre precinct in my neighborhood voted in for rent stabilization. Our votes matter and should be respected, not undermined. Democracy is we the people, not we the corporations or we the profits. If we do not have something to stop prior prioritizing the profits over people, homeless encampments is what we will have to normalize and desensitize ourselves with, because encampments will become the only available options for the people who have been marginalized. When we stabilize the rents, we stabilize our homes. We stabilize our communities, the educational outcomes, the employment outcomes, and you decrease socioeconomic fac excuse me, factors of violence plaguing our cities. Please do not move forward with Senate File 3414. Thank you. Thank you. And our final testifier this morning, Miranda Dills. If you could state your name and proceed with your testimony. 
Good morning. My name is Miranda Dills, and I'm a leader with the Young Adult Coalition of Isaiah. I live in Rent in Minneapolis in the Whittier neighborhood. And since I started renting, I have experienced landlords that have abused their power and position. I've also talked with hundreds of people through the course of the election last fall who have a similar experience. I've heard so many stories from friends and peers about the struggle to pay rent or find affordable, dignified places to live that meet their basic needs. And this fall, voters were clear that they wanted our city to have the power to pass a rent stabilization policy that would meet the needs of the people of our city. I am so insulted by the suggestion that Minneapolis voters did not understand what they were voting for. And I'm angry with the corporate landlord lobby and other interest groups who keep repeating this. In 2022, when voter rights are being curtailed across the nation, I can't believe this body would even consider a bill that retroactively voids the votes of 53% of the people in Minneapolis who voted for rent stabilization. Whether we are white, black, or brown, we all have a right to have a say in our communities. I urge you to not move Senate File 3414 any further. Everyone's vote, vote counts, and our vote is our voice on policies that have real implications on our daily lives. So to try to take that away from us is unacceptable. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, and I want to thank all the testifiers for abiding by the time limits. Uh, everyone did very well, so thank you for that. Uh, Senator Drayheim, any final comments before we go to member questions? Thank you, Chair, and thank you, members, and, and thank you, testifiers. Um, I, we, we all know how complicated the housing issues are, but they're really important. And a couple takeaways that I have. Um, we, we all know rent costs too much. We all know buying a house costs too much. And that is partially because of the supply and demand. Right now we have very low supply. It is pretty well agreed upon that we have a deficit of homes. The number varies depending on who you talk to, but the number that I throw around the most is about 50,000 housing units. We're short. When Mayor Carter was gracious enough to come and testify on this bill in one of the other hearings, he stated that St. Paul needed 11,000 housing units. 11,000 housing units. One thing I really didn't hear in the testimony was how many units have been canceled since rent control passed. So we needed 11,000 units over 5,000 housing units that we know of have been canceled because of rent control passing. Now, there are a couple of changes they're proposing to what passed in St. Paul, but they don't even have their terms defined. They don't even have what rent is defined yet. And, and some people might go, well, what do you mean what rent is? Does it include utilities? Does it include parking? Does it include internet? A lot of questions. I, I know people that work in the Senate building that have been affected of landlords raising the rent before this gets enacted here in a couple of months, from 40 to 60%. That is crazy. I, I, I feel their pain. When we look at how the state has reacted to housing, it, it, it's concerning to me, and that's why I think I've been probably the loudest voice up here the six years for housing, um, pushing it, pushing it, pathway to home ownership, uh, the equity gaps. I've been the loudest voice on all that. But we spend... When government finances a housing project, we spend in the low threes and out state up to $600,000 per unit. So in St. Paul and Minneapolis, it would be closer to the $600,000 per unit cost to build one apartment unit, not per building, per unit. So you take that times that 5,000 units 
that have been canceled, put on hold, underwriters backed out, underwriters meaning the banks that are financing the project. That's, that's another angle that I, I, I don't think all the testifiers understand. Um, I, obviously, I could go on and on and on. Um, I, I think I'll take questions if it's okay with you, Chair. Uh, one other point before we go there. Permits in St. Paul have dropped 80%. 80%. Nationwide, they're up 17%. Minneapolis is up 68%. But in St. Paul, they've dropped 80%, obviously because of rent control. Otherwise, their neighbor wouldn't have been affected. So thank you, Chair, and I'll, I'll stand for questions. Uh, thank you, Senator Graham, and thank you for your comments, uh, summarizing all the concerns and some of the questions that I know are out there. So Senator Bigham, you're first on the list. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Graham. You know this is a complex issue for me. <laughs> Because um, I agree with you that uh, the initiatives actually um, haven't done what they set out to do, actually. Um, I hope that St. Paul revi revises their initiatives so that new builds are included in it. Because I agree. What you've said is, is accurate about the St. Paul and the building permits and things getting pulled and dropping. So I hope they figured that out. Um, and I agree with you that rent is too high. And the testimony today, I especially want to call out um, Mr. Navarro. I mean, what a, what a wonderful um, testifier and testimony. So I appreciate that. Um, because what he said is accurate as well. So this is just, uh, I think, a situation where both sides have issues and concerns, none of which um, should overturn the results of an election. And so um, these initiatives are problematic, and they need to be fixed. And I have faith in the advocates. I have faith in the people. And I have faith in the local government that they're going to do that. And I want to draw attention to two letters in the packet of the League of Minnesota Cities and uh, Association of Metropolitan Municipalities, otherwise known as Metro Cities, opposing this uh, Senate file 3414. There is no house companion. Um, the state's failed. And you, ha you have been uh, a strong voice, Senator Dreheim, uh, for initiatives and and such, but the fact of the matter is, is when I meet with my cities and when I meet with my counties, you know what they want? They want housing bonds because you're right, the developers are coming. They're coming, they wanna build this and that means good jobs for our trades folks. So we need to, um, we have a lot of one-time money, Senator Dreheim, and I hope that at the end of the day when a bill is signed, we have a lot of money set aside for housing bonds, because we need it. Because then um, the CDAs and all these other um, local governments, um, the EDAs, housing authorities, all can um, match those dollars and build and get people housing with dignity so they can invest in their communities. Um, we need uh, additional money for rent assistance. More people are choosing to rent. And the rent is too high. There is no doubt about it. Housing is, is just. It's very expensive, and it shouldn't be. We can argue about why, and you know what? People on both sides of the argument have valid points. So um, it is a supply issue, Senator Draheim. But it also is the fact that there are landlords that take advantage of this, too. So there's, there's arguments to be made on both sides. But regardless, um, the big hand of government, the state coming in, and taking over a local government, reversing a decision, is something that I would never want to do. Uh, and I think preemption is not the answer. The answer is let's invest in housing bonds, let's invest in um, renters' assistance, and let's let's work um, with our local governments on um, coding codes, building codes, uh, and 
uh, streamlining a process for permitting, all of these issues have increased the cost, and not to mention supply chain issues, Senator Draham. So um, I'm not going to be supporting this today. Um, and I um, am going to stand with my local government and against preemption, but um, with the voters' voice. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Bigham. Senator Smolensky. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Senator Dreheim, for bringing this forward. The, I, I, I'm going to echo a lot of what um, Senator Bigham said because both sides have compelling arguments. And during COVID, we heard a lot, I heard a lot of my constituents who are landlords about concerns they had. And, uh, and I also heard a lot from my young renters uh, in my district. And both sides have, um, I don't know what to say. They're, they're, they're just, both sides are 100% correct. The problem I have with the, this bill, though, is it's thwarting, in my opinion, the will of the people. And when so many young people are increasingly becoming cynical towards the democratic process, and when not an overwhelming majority, but the majority of people, citizens of Minneapolis and St. Paul, um, spoke out and voted, and I do agree with um, um, Miss Kennedy when she said, um, um, "I'm insulted by the by the quote voters do not understand." Unquote. I think the voters do understand. That's what brought them to the polls. Uh, maybe the 50, 47 percent. Well, I guess uh, whatever percent didn't vote, maybe they didn't understand. But those that did, I have faith that they do understand because it brought them to the polls, and so. I guess um, that's why I'm, I, I, I'm leery of supporting this measure because I think the people have already spoken and, uh, and we need to listen to them. And also, but you, Senator Draheim, you and I have talked about this in the past and it, it's a growing concern of mine is um, with college debt and rent going out of control, how are the young people going to accumulate the wealth that for my wife and I was, came almost okay? Um, through hard work, and but nonetheless, these kids today are having struggles and um, uphill climbs that we didn't face. And so I hope we can continue to think about that in the coming um, months and years, and how can we get kids to accumulate that wealth and realize the American dream of, of owning a home of your own someday. And so anyways, um, but thanks for, um, and thank you, Mr. Chair, for having so many um, um, testifiers today to, to challenge us and um, make us think. So thank you. Thank you, Senator Swedinsky. Senator Newman. I agree with my colleagues on the other side of the aisle. Um, this really is a tough, this is a tough issue. Senator Dram, yes, you have been the champion on this issue for years now. And I am very slowly beginning to understand. I listened very closely to all of these testifiers. There's 15 people that came in and testified uh, against this measure. And we have to listen to that. And, and Mr. Chairman, you, uh, I, do, I agree. Thank you for allowing so many people to testify on this issue. Uh, question Senator Drown. Senator Drown. Where I struggle is the preemption, the local election. I really do struggle with that. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, we've got, an, a, you have indicated, 80% decrease in permits in St. Paul. Uh, do, do any comments that you may have mm -hmm. as to the effect of that massive decrease in construction in St. Paul? Does it bleed out into the other areas of the state and have a ne negative effect? Uh, and the reason I'm asking is, is there a negative effect of this local election on uh, our statewide economy, which would justify preemption? Senator Dreheim. Thank you, uh, Senator Newman and, and Chair uh, Jasinski, for the question. This is the number one studied aspect of housing in the world, <clears throat> not just in the United States, across the globe. And I have quoted a quote from one of the most respected economists across the globe, 
um, and I'm paraphrasing here, I, I, I didn't bring the quote, but he said that the best way to destroy a city is by enacting rent control or bombing. Um, so this is the guy that picks the, the Nobel Prize for economics. <clears throat> So it has been studied and studied and studied all across the globe. It gets repackaged, um, rent stabilization instead of rent control. Um, but what they have found is what we predicted when we were trying to stop this last year, that it does bleed out into neighboring communities. It does stop people coming from out of state to invest in the whole state. Um, and I don't know if, if Mr. Smith wants, if he has any, any stats or data uh, with the multi-housing association on that. Um, but this is one of the things that we studied in business school on basic principles of supply and demand. Um, so I, I would like to phone a friend if I could, Chair. Senator Graham, go ahead, Mr. Smith. Mr. Chair, Senator Newman, uh, to your question. Uh, a recent survey following the enactment of the rent control ordinance in St. Paul uh, was conducted by the National Multifamily Housing Council and found that 23% uh, of national uh, equity and debt capital investors uh, said they would not invest in Minnesota. Um, when you enact rent control, um, in a state that means, uh, and just in a local jurisdiction, it means there's a pathway. So New York, New Jersey, Oregon, California, Maryland, uh, and now Minnesota are put into a, a category of their own uh, for debt and equity investors in multifamily housing. It says there is a pathway to rent control, which means there could be a pathway to rent control in Egan, Red Wing, Rochester, and national investors just say, we'll go somewhere else because we're not prepared to accept that risk. So there is uh, statewide implications for the passage of rent control in St. Paul. Thank you. Senator Newman, follow up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, thank you, Senator Graham and Mr. Smith. Um, the, the, the issue here, of course, is preemption versus local control, local election. And there are uh, compelling interests on both sides. There are seven senators sitting in this room and out of a total of 67. So what I've decided I'm going to do is I'm going to vote to pass this bill out of this committee. Um, and I would, I would sincerely hope that we will hear from our other 60 uh, colleagues on this issue. I don't want to just rely on the seven of us. The compelling testimony on the part of, of uh, the folks who are opposed to this, there's compelling testimony on the, on the folks that are in favor of this bill. And um, uh, I think that we ought to continue this discussion. And uh, lo local election versus preemption, boy, that's a tough one. So I want to hear from other senators other than the seven. So Mr. Chairman, I will be supporting moving this bill uh, out of this committee. I don't know what I'm going to do after that. Thank you, Senator Newman. Senator Weger. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Vice Chair Newman, I appreciated the comments about the dilemma, perhaps, that uh, you're, you're faced with on the preemption argument. For the jurisdiction of this committee, I fundamentally, strongly support local control and we the people for deciding for those areas that we have carved out. We are all elected, local officials are elected and we have a remedy in place for people to respond, to petition their government. If we disagree with something, we don't take away that right. That is inherently dictatorial. I think it goes contrary to our very democracy. Are there problems? 
with rent control, with the housing. We have a crisis. That was the message that was sent by the voters in St. Paul. There is a crisis. And it's up to us collectively at all levels to figure it out. They sent a message. They have that right to. And I vehemently disagree with taking that right away from the people because we disagreed with the outcome. We need to figure it out. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Weaver. Senator Howe. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and with that, then, I, I guess uh, then we should uh, stop with uh, the building codes that goes to anyone, any city. We force the building code on anyone with a population of 2,500 or more. We should stop that. Uh, there's a lot of folks that would like us to do the state building code statewide, but it's not that case. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm torn with the fact that there's all kinds of mandates we do with all kinds of things statewide. And to sit here and say that uh, we all lavish and support local control is not always the case because we take a lot of that local control by putting mandates on all kinds of things throughout the state. So, uh, and some of that is, is to restrict that local control from that availability to what is out there. And so I'm a big supporter of local control, but in some respects, I'd like to see us force the building code statewide. So uh, it's, it's, you know, you, you have to, to look at the issue and, and it's not always easy to do that local control piece. So uh, as much as we'd like to say we, we would like to, to make that all, uh, to do away with all state mandates and do just local control. So it's, you, you have to look at the issue uh, and when, it, when, when one thing happens in one city that affects statewide, we have to be careful on how we constrict that and, and take into account the effects. Because if you want to grow uh, wealth in someone, home ownership is where that should be at. And this does not help. I mean, we have to watch that and we have to do what's important to grow home ownership. I don't think rent control does that. Uh, in fact, I think it's it, it, the place that I rent down here told me they weren't looking to do an increase until this got passed. And now my rent skyrocketed. So I, I, as much as I support local control, I, I agree with Senator Newman. I think this needs a wider discussion. And I think the, the full Senate should, should uh, take a look at this. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Howe. Uh, and I'll make a couple of comments as well. I think we've had great discussion. We've had great testifiers. I totally get. I would echo Senator uh, Dreheim has been a strong opponent of making sure that it's affordable. People can live in apartments uh, with not seeing rent increases. Uh, a little bit of background on myself. I've been in, involved in the real estate uh, business for th over 30 years. Uh, from appraisal to property management to development. Uh, at one time, owned and operated over 350 units myself. Owned or operated, had 16 units myself that I developed. Um, and, and I definitely understand the concern uh, of a developer coming in wanting to build when you're restricted. Uh, the apartments that I built uh, were uh, s s uh, not separately metered for heat. Uh, right now we're seeing 60% increases for heat. 60% was the increase that I saw at one of my buildings uh, just in the last month. So if you have a developer that uh, is renting uh, to people and they get a 60% increase in their utilities and they can't raise their rents, something's wrong. And that's what's going on out there right now. Um, I did have a conversation with an individual who lives in St. Paul who did vote uh, in favor of the rent control. And uh, after explaining the economies and, and developers and how people invest and not invest and, and utilities, and he said, wow, I didn't understand the, the bigger picture. They, you know, they see they don't want their rents increased, but if you look at the bigger picture of investment and, and what's going on and uh, those things, they do understand. So I don't think all the people that voted do understand the, the whole effect of what happened. Uh, and, and voting for that. They obviously wanted to see their rents uh, you know, not going up huge, which I totally understand. 
Uh, I will tell you in the apartment that I live here in St. Paul, I've, I've actually renewed leases about three or four times since I've been in the set. I've never seen more than a 5% five, 5 increase, never over. Uh, in December, underneath my bill, 43.79% increase. 43.79%. Now, again, the taxpayers here in the state are paying for our rent, but they're not paying for staff and other people. Uh, so 43.79% increase in, in one year, something's wrong. And, I, and I'll echo also on the local control being a mayor. I know Senator Bigelow was involved in county stuff as well. You struggle with that because of, of local control, what you're doing. But if it has an impact on the overall health of our state, then maybe we should step in. Now, there are a lot of us who are not happy with what happened in the civil unrest, and we've uh, statewide made some changes in law enforcement because of what happened in Minneapolis-St. Paul. So I think if this is done, we're going to have the same issue of trying to correct a few things that have happened because of this being put in place. I think there are some unintended consequences that have happened uh, with this. I think the city of St. Paul will admit that. I've uh, had a conversation with Mayor Carter as well and, and, and told him about my rent increase. So we've had that discussion. Uh, so I'll be uh, supporting this bill, uh, but I do struggle just as much as uh, Senator Newman does uh, with the local control issue. But again, I think if it impacts the effect of our overall health of our state, then we do have to take uh, into consideration that and maybe make some changes. So again, you're seeing it, and, and I think it's going to extend through Minneapolis-St. Paul and continue out through the state. It's going to cause housing crises throughout uh, from the metro outward and it's going to have an effect. So I think that's our duty uh, to step in and make that, that change uh, and, and put it to the full Senate, as, as Senator Newman said. Uh, so I, I will tell you, I struggle with it eventually, and I've had the conversation with Senator Draheim about should we hear this bill, should we not? But I, I'm really happy we did. We've had great conversation, and uh, I think we're going to have a bigger discussion as we continue on. So uh, Senator Westrom, you want to speak. Thank you, Mr. Speak uh, Mr. Chair. and. Uh, uh, just Senator, Senator Draheim to the bill and then some comments. Uh, the, the preemption part, um, is that if, if your bill changed, and I'm not proposing changes here, but as discussions go forward, uh, other senators and legislators uh, look at it, uh, could your bill survive without the preemption, uh, leaving it to the two communities that have passed it, but, but changing it going forward so everybody's prospectively looking. Uh, just, just comment on that if, if you could um, as we hear some discussion and then I'd like to offer some other comments for uh, from a perspective, perspective of a district that, that borders two other states and uh, Senator Draham. Senator Draham. Thank you, uh, Senator Westrom and, and Chair. Um, you know, we obviously can, can take out that piece of it, but Government exists to protect individual rights. Individual rights. Rent control violates property rights of the landlord and is essentially government taking from the individual. State policy should be more focused on protecting the rights of citizens than the power of government, any government. Mm -hmm. um, so, to, to the rights piece, uh, our Constitution is designed to protect the rights of the individual, even if the majority of the people want to take those rights away from another individual. So that, that is the bigger argument. Uh, our, one of our building blocks of our country was on individual property rights. When my grandpa fled Germany to come here, that is why he came here, was for property rights. So th that is one thing that we really haven't touched on much here today, is the individual property rights and, and what government level, but it all comes back, when you talk local control, back to the individual. Um, can we remove the November date? Of course we can. Will there be a fiscal? Uh, a fiscal implication of doing that. You gotta do the math again. Mayor Carter said he needed 11,000 units. 5,000 units plus have already been canceled. And you take each one of those units times five or $600,000. We're talking billions of dollars here, guys. 
billions of dollars that we could use for other programs. We've had housing instability programs for decades. Obviously, they're not working. Every one of those testifiers, we have failed them. So there, obviously, there's a lot of complicated issues. We've had a great discussion here, a lot of different perspectives. Um, I, I think this is the right solution. But most of you know me that I am willing to work on um, other ideas. So if you have other ideas, please reach out to me. I, I, I would be happy to entertain something different uh, Senator Westrom. And, Senator Westrom, follow Mr. Up. Chair, uh, Senator Dreheim, and uh, thank you, uh, Senator Bigham said, and, and others, um, you, you have been a champion uh, to find housing fixes. Uh, so uh, I think that should be well known uh, because it's obvious what we've done for the last 10, 20, and 50 years hasn't worked our way out of this problem. And uh, as you know, uh, I've said before, when we had housing in the Ag Committee, um, we're spending more to get less. And uh, let me just offer the perspective uh, to, to the, all the testifiers and uh, members here. My, my Senate district goes as far west as you can go in our state. It borders much of North Dakota, much of South Dakota, uh, right in the center of the state. And I was just at a meeting, uh, Mr. Chair and members, uh, recently out in Breckenridge again, and reminded by the local residents there, and it reminds me of the, what the mayor told me in my office a few years back. A senator, 50 years ago, Breckenridge was the big city. Now Wapaton, just across the border in, in North Dakota, is five times the size of Breckenridge, upwards of 10 to 12,000 people, Breckenridge, uh, has seen that kind of decline, largely because of codes, building codes, uh, taxes, and other things. And uh, Senator Eakin and myself have been asked by locals in Moorhead. Moorhead's got the same phenomenon. Fargo just exploded in the 70s, 80s, 90s to, to, to today to be much bigger than Moorhead. East Grand Forks, further up, the same phenomenon. Uh, those cities are much smaller on the Minnesota side. And the bill that Senator Eakin and I have been asked to carry by locals is relief of the statewide building code, Senator Howe, because just the building code alone in Minnesota makes it that much more expensive to build just on the east side of the Red River as opposed to the west side of the Red River. And so Senator Dreheim, you're right on point. These costs do matter and people decide where to move. And in Western Minnesota, they've made hundreds and hundreds of decisions to just move a few miles across the border, turning Wapaton into a city five times the size of Breckenridge, which was smaller than Breckenridge just 50, 60 years ago. And so uh, I, I think you're, you're, you're really uh, trying to address an issue uh, there's not an easy solution. It, it does seem that maybe the city of Minneapolis and St. Paul will have to live with their decisions, and maybe, maybe in five or ten years we're going to see that is the solution, and all the other cities say, man, look at how it's done added rental units. It doesn't look that that's going to be the case right now. It looks like it, it's going to probably cause the cities to further decline or implode, but uh, time will tell. Um, but but we do need to get our arms around this because spending six hundred thousand dollars or four or five hundred thousand dollars on each apartment unit that's being built is not a sustainable model either. And there's no way you could capture enough rent to pay for that kind of investment. Um, and, and so I, I appreciate you bringing this. This has been a very good discussion, Mr. Chair. I I do thank you for for hearing this. Sometimes we want to duck the tough issues. Uh, talking about them, I think, is going to be the best solution to um, come up with the solution. If this isn't the exact solution, maybe there is one lurking or looming that will develop out of this discussion. And so uh, I appreciate everybody's uh, comments, uh, both sides, because I think that discussion is really going to be helpful. Uh, because this housing issue is, 
is really a problem. Housing is in short supply. We in rural Minnesota are benefiting from, uh, from the issues going on in Minneapolis, St. Paul. Housing is cheaper in rural Minnesota. Uh, so people are discovering that. The internet, high speed internet is giving people the flexibility to move uh, hundreds of miles away or even an hour or two away from the cities and, and work in many cases. And so uh, there is flexibility. Uh, there is options that might change the dynamics and maybe not everybody has to live in Minneapolis and St. Paul and pay that high rent. Uh, they can move to areas where there is uh, easier access to land and uh, cheaper uh, uh, property to, to either buy and own. Home ownership is, is ultimately a, a great way, the best way to probably have everybody um, achieve the American dream. Thank so, you, Senator West. Thank you, Sorry, Senator we have to Dray. finish up. Uh, one thing that I, uh, I'm going to go back to Senator Graham for final closing comments. One thing I forgot during testimony uh, that I wanted to bring up is, as a developer and owner of, of apartments, if, if I'm restricted to the amount of percent as an owner to increase my rents and the carpets and the walls and the appliances and all those things are getting old and the windows and the roofs, all those things are getting old and I can't raise my rents, what do you think is going to happen to the quality of our rental supply out there? It's going to go down. People are not going to, and it's another conversation I have with the gentleman uh, talking about rent control that he voted for. He didn't realize, well, wow, I didn't think of that. So again, I think there's some unintended consequences that people don't realize what's happening. Again, if you're a, a developer and you can't raise your rents and your, your carpet needs replacement and you need to paint your walls and your roof, roof needs replacement and you're not doing those, there's issues. So it does have an effect. We had a great conversation today. I want to thank everyone for that conversation. Uh, so with that, uh, Senator Draham, closing comments. I once again want to thank all the members and, and thank you, Chair, for, for the hearing. I, I think this is vitally important for our state. You know, homes are so important. Um, this last year really spotlights how important having a, a safe, stable home is. Um, I have a lot more bills coming on housing that deal with um, codes and costs. Etc. You'll have hopefully a chance to vote on those also down the road. Um, if if there's one bill that I think would make the most difference in housing costs, um, I, I think this is it um, for the metro area. Um, as far as housing infrastructure bonds, we have done more housing infrastructure bonds in the last five years than the previous 25 years. We have invested hundreds of millions of dollars into housing. Um, so it isn't like we're not trying to do the right thing. I, I think we are. And the emphasis, obviously for me, the end goal is home ownership and the pathway to get there. But as discussed earlier, how can you save up for a down payment when you're spending every penny on rent? I get that. Uh, but the only way we solve this problem is to build more units. So we need all hands on deck to build more units. Rent control, as we heard through testimony, hurts our ability as a state to build more units. So please support the bill. I appreciate your time. I know we've ran long, so thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator Draham. Actually, right on schedule at 9.45 was our goal. So with that, Senator Newman, would you, would you please move the bill? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, with that, I would move uh, Senate file what it, 3414 uh, be recommended to pass and be placed on general orders. Well, thank you. Senator Newman moves that Senate file 3414 be recommended to pass and be placed on general <laughs> orders. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. no. Motion carries. Thank you again, Senator Grayheim. Thank you, members. Next on our bill, our, our agenda, the final bill of the day, Senate file 3564. Senator Wicklin, apologize for making you wait all this time because you've been here the whole time. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to Senator Wicklin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I appreciate being able to present um, Senate File 3564 this morning and uh, appreciate the, being able to listen to the discussion on the previous bill. Um, 
Senate File 3564 is a bill that the City of Bloomington uh, brought forward to me, um, which would allow them to increase the size of their Housing re and Redevelopment Authority um, Board of Commissioners. And um, here to talk about this uh, bill and speak about the need for it um, is Erica Coleman, who's the HRA um, Authority Administrator for the City of Bloomington. So I'll turn it over to her. Uh, thank you, Ms. Coleman. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Chair. Erica Coleman, Housing and Redevelopment Authority in and for the City of Bloomington Administrator. So today before you, we have Senate file number 3564 where we are requesting an amendment of the language that will allow for us to come under chapter 469 um, to increase our board. When we were created, our enabling legislation uh, in 1971 restricted our amount, number of commissioners on the board to five. At that time, the authority was governed by Minnesota statute sections 462, chapter 462. In 1977, our authority amended our labeling, enabling legislation that still continue to require us to be at five commissioners, but it removed other provisions from the enabling legislation of chapter of 1971, excuse me. In 1987, provisions of chapter 462 that governed housing authorities were repealed and replaced by the housing and redevelopment authorities provisions in chapter 469. However, the housing and redevelopment authority in and for the city of Bloomington did not come under chapter 469 at that time. So today, we are requesting that you um, approve this request to amend our enabling legislation that allows for us to remove the restriction of five commissioners for our board and to come under chapter 469 for that reason. I can stand for any questions. Thank you, Ms. Coleman. Questions for members? Senator Westrom. Mr. Chair, um, to the testifier, so you're going from five to what and we just had a bill in here for a few weeks ago trying to go from three to five because of quorum issues and other things. So can you talk about that a little bit more? Ms. Cole. Thank, thank you, Chair, members of the committee. We are coming under Chapter 469 in the request, so we would go from five to seven. Senator Westrom. Th thank you. Thank you. Um, I guess that answers my question. Just, just a question: to, to How much will that expend, ex, add to the cost of uh, running and operating the board? Have you figured that out, Ms. Coleman? Thank you, Chair. Members, uh, our commissioners do receive a per diem of fifty dollars per meeting, and we have um, twenty-four meetings per year. So we would increase by a hundred dollars a month for two commissioners, which hundred times twelve be about, what, $1,200 a year that we would increase the cost, but we would allow for greater representation as the city of Bloomington is growing and our uh, population is changing. We would allow for greater representation to include more residents of the city of Bloomington to go through the application process to be interviewed and selected to participate on the, on the HRA commission. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Seeing none, Senator Wicklund, final comments. Uh, no, thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate um, uh, appreciate being able to present the bill, and um, I think it's a reasonable um, change. It also um, allows the statute to be updated from um, what has been um, in legislation for you know for a long time, and it brings us all into um, a, the chapter of law that it really belong, belongs in. So I appreciate your time today. Thank you. Senator Bigham, would you wish to move the bill? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Ms. Coleman, for testifying today. Thank you, Senator Wickland, for bringing the bill forward. With that, I move that Senate file 3564 be recommended to pass and sent to general orders. Thank you. Senator Bigham recommends a Senate file 3414 be passed and recommend. Sorry, 3564 be recommended to pass and sent to general orders. Senator Weger, did you have yes. a question? Yes, thank you. Mr. Chair, yes, we we support this, but Senator Wickland and maybe Mr. Chair, would this be a logical candidate for the consent calendar? Uh, 
We're just going to send it to general orders. Thank you, Senator Weger. Uh, motion is made. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, there being no other items on the agenda today, we are. Senator Swidinski, did you have a comment? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I do have a comment. Um, Go ahead, Senator. Given the um, floor debate yesterday on the Southwest Light Rail and the um, comments that were made about the Met Council, could we maybe entertain the idea of having a hearing on the transparent, lack of transparency, lack of accountability, and some ideas, the pros and cons of Met Council? Because I think a lot of our constituents are going to be wanting to, us to um, discuss and talk about that further. And, I'm just throwing out that idea. If it's even in a, it, within our purview as a as a as a committee, is um, Met Council governance within our jurisdiction? Uh, thank you, Senator. So Smith. it's just an inquiry for the chair. Yep. Yes, and it is under our purview, so we can do that. Uh, we've had some discussions on the schedule. Uh, we are approaching deadline here, but we'll see if we can get something on there, at least informational. Uh, I don't know if we have the consensus to go forward with a, with a bill, but I will uh, definitely uh, give it some t time and consideration. Yeah, and I wasn't even looking at a bill because a legislative audit report would probably suggest, but just an informational hearing. Senator Bigham. Thank you. To that point, um, I have uh, the bill introduced for the blue ribbon recommendations from, what was that, Senator Newman, like three years ago, two and a half years ago that that was done? Probably more than that, three years ago. Um, and Senator Duckworth and I introduced that. Um, and so I, I mean, that might be, uh, even if it's informational, it might give you at least a, a platform to start on. And I think we have several other bills, so we'll see if we can fit it in the schedule. Uh, the ones that we need to pass, we'll get by as well. And then if we have time, we'll definitely do that after we get through first uh, deadline. So uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, being no other uh, items on the agenda, we are hereby adjourned. <laughs>